This is a good and a bad part about being 61 years of age, that is your CV becomes a bit overly long, forgive me for that. Um, I've got the graveyard shift, um, so this is the point of the day when you're thinking about cocktails and dinner, so do your best to hang in here just a little bit longer. Given the, uh, the title of our conference, uh, it seemed to me to be appropriate to be addressing religious freedom uh, from a Christian perspective. And given the uh, subject assigned to me being uh, the Israel Folau Affair, I'm necessarily going to focus on freedom uh, to focus, sorry, let me put it another way, necessarily focus on the freedom um, of religion, that is to give full expression to religious convictions within the confines of an employment relationship. In the employment context, uh, our freedom to practice our Christianity, or to put it another way, our freedom to be overtly militant Christians in our workplace is constrained by the laws that our parliament makes, but uh, more relevantly for the Israel for our matter, it's constrained by the employment contracts we enter into as well. So in looking at what... Uh, looking at the, uh, the extent to which the law empowers us and also constrains us, which is the way we, uh, we need to go here, we need to start perhaps with the biggest of laws. Uh, that, that slide there is just really so you could uh, get a bit, bit of a mental map of where I'm going. Um, so looking at the biggest of laws is uh, the, uh, the Constitution in the sense that uh, that's the... Uh, that's the, the law that is most influential. If you're thinking about all of the things that our parliaments can do, uh, that's the biggest of them. If you look at section 116, just to give me a second, I'm just going to get uh, different notes in front of me. What you'll see there is the Commonwealth has got the, uh, is essentially prohibited from making various kinds of laws, and there are essentially uh, four things built into that section 116 provision, but one of those is not to make laws for the prohibiting of the free exercise of any religion. So if you're looking at that, the immediate reaction is to say, well, fee, that's great news, isn't it? Nothing can be done that's going to curtail our freedom. Unfortunately, uh, in High Court cases that have dealt with um, even peripherally uh, that, uh, that freedom, the courts made it very, very clear that uh, our religious beliefs are not, as uh, the quote there says, inviolate. We're obliged to obey the law as the, uh, the Parliament hands it down. Uh, so effectively, our religious freedom is going to be constrained by the um, by the protections and constraints that the, uh, that the Parliament decides to enact for us. So let's look at, in the employment context, what sorts of freedoms uh, are given to us and what sort of freedoms the Parliament taketh away. Let's start with the Fair Work Act. That's um, a logical place to begin. Section 351 of the Fair Work Act, that section is found in the General Protections uh, part of the Fair Work Act, provides that an employer may not take adverse action against a person um, who's an employee because of, and you can see the list and read it there, and one of the things that's on that list is religion. Uh, you'll see in there some expressions like uh, adverse action. Adverse action is specifically defined in that Act in Section 342, and it includes things such as dismissal, but it also includes injuring somebody in their employment or altering their position to their detriment. So that's one of the uh, protections. Uh, there's also uh, Section 772, which you see there. That uh, is found uh, later on in the legislation in the unlawful dismissal provisions. Uh, in that particular section, uh, the, uh, the Fair Work Act provides that there can't be a termination of employment for reasons that include any of the following, and then there's a long list, and as you'll see, 
I've mentioned subsection F there, so it's a bit, bit down the list. But in subsection F, there's a little laundry list as well, very similar to that which is found in 351. In fact, it's word for word what's in section 351. Uh, and it likewise includes uh, protections from, uh, from dismissal based on um, somebody's religious convictions. So what we, what we take from that is that the, the law provides some benefits for us in that, on the one hand, our religion is supposed to protect us from adverse action in workplaces. It's also supposed to protect us from being dismissed because of our Christianity in workplaces. That might sound like it's all good news, but it's not. Because at the same time, uh, it recognises religion not Christianity. And what that means is that while protecting our Christianity, it also constrains us not to do anything in our workplaces which uh, amounts to adverse action because somebody has a different religion. So, as uh, I think Tim was saying a bit earlier, when you're looking at religious liberty, uh, it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword for Christians. On the one hand, the question is, can we practice our Christianity? If the answer to that's yes, then it also means we've got to accord the same level of freedom, the same latitude to uh, to give full expression to your religious views uh, if you happen to be uh, a Muslim, for example. So the situation for us is, yes, we have statutory protections, but those statutory protections also act as statutory constraints. One further uh, statutory protection that we have, and this, this is a peculiarly Western Australian based, is found in our Equal Opportunity Act and in Part 4. Uh, that Act provides for it, being, uh, for it to be unlawful for an employer to discriminate against a person on the grounds of their religious or political conviction, and then it sets out a range of uh, situations where that can't be done. So things such as the arrangement in determining who will be employed, so that covers things such as the process you might follow in recruiting somebody, including selection criteria, things you might include in, in an advertisement. Um, arrangements around who, determining who will be employed, which again goes down to selection criteria. The terms and conditions that are offered, so we can't offer Christians terms and conditions that are way more favourable than we'd offer anybody else for the same role. Um, Denying access to opportunities, we can't have a situation where uh, we're denied access to, to promotion because we're Christians. Likewise, if we're Christians, we can't deny somebody access to promotion just because they're not. And likewise, dismissing uh, the, uh, the employee or providing any other detriment. Uh, there's a, another one which is a bit of an odd one, which is, um, I say it's odd, but uh, there's also a prohibition on refusing permission for religious practice during working hours. Um, and that, uh, that's an interesting one because uh, for Christians it affords us really no great benefit because um, our religious practice is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and uh, we don't require any particular times of day to be, to be doing anything particular. So I guess that one uh, assists probably uh, those people who need uh, prayer rooms and such during the day. <laughs> so as Christians, we're obliged to respect the laws that those whom God has put over us have made subject only to the caveat that, and I say this with apologies to Chief Justice Mason and uh, Justice Brennan who said the contrary, that we as Christians can't bind ourselves to obeying the state if to do so requires us to disobey God. To approach it otherwise is to make the state the greater of greater importance than God, that is the God who established the state in the first place. So therein lies some tension for people of faith. On the one hand, there are things that God's commanded us to do that if we were unconstrained we would see as gone ordering things to do, essentially discretionary things. And on the other hand, there are ordinary man-made laws that might prohibit some of those activities. 
So it follows that uh, a Christian employee must decide on matters of mandatory conduct, those things that God requires of us, uh, whether to obey God's word or to obey the ordinary man-made law. It's not hard, really, to imagine a circumstance where you might have some conflict about that. Uh, we know, just looking at a biblical example, that uh, Daniel had it in his day and he ended up spending some time in the lion's den over it. We have uh, a similar sort of balance between constraints and, and benefits uh, in employment contracts. So, uh, as you would have seen from the outline, where I'm going with this is there are constraints, benefits and constraints associated with the legislative framework, but there are also constraints which come out of your employment contract. So typically, an employment contract will in include uh, obligations that will be implied by law. Now, uh, for, for the lawyers in the room, they'll know what that means. For the non-lawyers in the room, what that means is even if there's no express agreement about uh, including those as contractual terms, the law will assume that you would have agreed to it, uh, on, or more importantly, the law, will, the law will say, in this species of contract, this kind of term is necessary, and it will be included in all contracts of that kind. Um, so in employment contracts, there, there, are, there are a range of implied terms, but the relevant ones for, my, for our purposes today is the duty of obedience and cooperation and the duty of fidelity and good faith, sometimes described as uh, a duty of, of loyalty. Now, those are uh, obligations that come into the employment contract for, without any agreement simply because of the, the kind of contract it is. So let's just look at the, uh, the duty of obedience very brief, briefly first. This amounts to the employee being obliged to obey the, law, the employer's lawful and reasonable directions. We don't have time to unpack what that really means because there's, a, there's a, a bit to it, but for our purposes we could put it this way, that an employee is obliged to obey his or her employer in all matters that arise within the scope of the employee's duties as long as compliance doesn't require the employee to break any law uh, and the instruction is reasonable in its context. The duty of fidelity and good faith is a, a, a lot harder to summarise, uh, but it suffices for our purposes and at the risk of a little inaccuracy to summarise it generally as a, a duty to act honestly, with integrity, consistent with the employer's interests, even sometimes to the point of subordinating the employee's own interests. So we can simplify those obligations and, and transpose those to Israel for now for just a second by saying that um, Israel Palau was required to obey the instructions that his employer gave him about social media to the extent that such an instruction related to his employment and is neither unlawful nor unreasonable. Uh, and, he wasn't, and he was also obliged not to do anything that was contrary to Rugby Australia's interests. Okay, I'm going to go away from Israel for just a second and I'll come back to it. So again, as Christians, we can be confronted with the tension between keeping our contractual promises and honouring God. Now, bearing in mind what we talked about there was there is an obligation on us to obey what's lawful and reasonable. Lawful and reasonable does not normally not always equal ethical. Um, so as Christians, we need to be both promise keepers, those people who do what we promise to do in our employment contracts, and at the same time we need to be uh, honouring God and not doing anything that is contrary to uh, the, pr the principles that we've been taught in Scripture. So let's just look at that and how that might work itself out practically for a second. How would you be if you were a Christian graphic designer or a compositor or a printing press operator whose employer has quite lawfully given you instructions to print things? The only trouble is he's just got the contract to produce Penthouse magazine. How would you as a Christian react if you were essentially instructed to help produce that kind of filth? The 
In that particular example, there are mechanisms that can be used to get the Christian worker out from under. Generally, what we would do is uh, say to the employer, you're sexually harassing the employee by requiring them to deal with that sort of material. That's a particular example where there's a way out. There isn't always a way out. Now, there are also things over which the Christian has um, some control, but there are also things that uh, become matters of contract where the Christian might unwillingly or carelessly or naively impose obligations on himself or herself. That's to say they're a result of a person consenting to various kinds of constraints in their employment contract uh, and including constraints that might operate outside work. Okay, so that takes us to Palau territory. We'll come, we'll come to Israel particularly in a minute, but the, the context really needs to be set first. Increasingly, employment contracts contain requirements that employees comply with his or her employer's codes and policies. Generally speaking, uh, those codes have been around for a long time. As long as I can remember, the first one that I ran into was about 1977. So typically, a contract will allow the employer to create and vary policies and codes and those codes of conduct, by virtue of the contract, would bind the employee to comply with them. So typically, the, uh, the contractual term would also permit the employer to add new policies or codes, to withdraw existing policy and codes, and to vary them. The amendments or variations of withdrawals don't generally require anybody's consent. The consent's been given when you signed the contract that said, I agree to be bound by the codes as amended, as uh, as promulgated or as withdrawn. So those terms arguably then uh, will give the employee, employer a great deal of discretion with respect to um, uh, imposing obligations through policy that perhaps wouldn't be directly uh, agreed to in a contract, particularly since policies can be varied without consent, which means that things can be adopted uh, without the employee specifically agreeing to them. Now, ordinarily we'd say, okay, well, so what? Um, employers haven't done a great deal of damage with policies over the years. Uh, well, I think that's changing. Um, there are some things that an employee, employer can't uh, make policies about. There, there are statutory minimum conditions that are applied through, say, the Minimum Conditions of Employment Act in WA or the National Employment Standards of the Fair Work Act would apply to prevent an employer making policies that undercut basic employment conditions. However, there's fertile ground outside of that that can be regulated reasonably effectively through, uh, through policies. And that creates ground for essentially policy activism for employers such that they might then regulate the private activities of their employees. Historically, and in the normal course of things, uh, given what I've said about codes of conduct going back to 1970, you might, might be saying to yourself, well, that's a relatively benign thing. Employers have historically concentrated on their knitting, made deliberate decisions not to intrude into the employee's private life unnecessarily. However, what we're seeing in relatively recent times is that some employers insist that their corporate values be modelled or supported or at the very least not contradicted by employees' behaviour outside of working time. Now, to some extent that intrusion has been justified by the advent of social media because the advent of social media has turned um, all of us who might be uh, closet keyboard warriors into immediate and uh, perhaps widely read publishers. Um, and that, that enables uh, people at the stroke of a pen and without any editor overseeing what they're doing um, reach out to a significant size audience. Um, that becomes more problematic for employers when, if you're looking at the social media profile that a person might have, um, sometimes where they work or photographs of the context in which they work 
might be might be there to be seen. From the employer's perspective, the alarm bells are, how would I like it if one of my employees is saying um, uh, particularly offensive things on social media and by implication um, aligning uh, his employer with uh, with those with those kinds of statements. Um, we had um, the issue of same-sex marriage came up uh, in the in the context of, uh, of of that sort of social media publication. But, you, but what, what you see going on now is because of the sensitivity to uh, what people might say in social media and beyond and because employers have seen that there's some strategic advantage to be gained by aligning themselves with social issues in a way that they've perhaps never done before, uh, we are now seeing policies that become more pervasive. So just take the same-sex marriage discussion as your starting point. Um, there were, uh, I think, marriage Australian marriage equality boasted that there were 851 organisations that overtly expressed support for same-sex marriage and allowed their logos to be used on promotional material. 851 corporations saw it as necessary to get overt on the front foot and say, we are in favour of same-sex marriage. Now, one wonders, why would you bother, if you're a corporate and you're focused on corporate objectives, to have a position on same-sex marriage at all? And yet, 850 companies that marriage, uh, Australian Marriage Equality referred to did it. Now, those companies included both major domestic airlines, all major banks, and some relatively small ones. For you lawyers in the room, all the top-tier law firms, every one of them, and the top-tier accounting firms and many smaller ones. Um, just for the record, I practice alone, and one of the reasons I practice alone is because I didn't want any large law firm telling me what I could think. Um, major clothing brands also included there, uh, major insurers, and many, many more. So the rationale for the display of this sort of corporate philosophising varied from employer to employer. Some preached that it was simply not fair. Others said that being inclusive was simply... Uh, a, a gateway to a more productive workforce. Some said it was simply representing uh, Australian values and uh, others said that employees will generally be better if they're allowed to be who they are at work. But it's not the only issue where this policy issue has, uh, has come about um, and that there's many corporate viewpoints on many things now. So. What's fair to say is corporate Australia has decided not to focus on its knitting but to get involved in other things. The knock-on effect of all that is that the policies uh, therefore change or adapt to reflect the virtue signalling behaviour that's going on. So just to give you a few examples, and I'm conscious that I'm going to be up against time here, so I'm going to move quickly. Uh, I'm aware of a top-tier professional firm dismissing a relatively senior executive because he expressed a view against same-sex marriage simply said to him um, that uh, his values were out of line with the corporate philosophy and his face no longer fitted. Uh, I was aware of an employee shown the door because he dared to express an opinion that was philosophically uh, different from that of his employer, and they told him that he couldn't perform work in his organisation if he had that kind of viewpoint. Recently I read of a case where an employer with interest in the renewable energy sector sacked the person who wasn't who said that they weren't a supporter of the Paris Agreement and wasn't in favour of tax subsidies for renewable energy ventures. The employee worked in the safety and health space. Thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll move quickly. Uh, and she was essentially sacked for not doing anything ex except uh, being aligned with beliefs that the employer didn't share. OK, so what we're getting to there is that it leads you to the place where employers have got... Um, uh, an interest in social issues and they're expressing them um, uh, widely and they're going into territory that uh, historically they hadn't done. Let me just get to Israel Folau before uh, Peter throws the, the bell at me. Um, I, I need to make a confession before I start talking about Israel Folau. Um, before uh, I 
I confess my support for his right to speak plainly about what the scriptures teach about same-sex expression. Uh, I also confess that um, I don't fly Qantas, I won't wear acid products, and I don't support the Wallabies anymore. Uh, I, I wrote to Rugby Australia and told them that. Um, let me just deal with the gist of the Israel Palau affair. So he's a highly credentialed, world-class rugby player who's dismissed from his employment with Rugby Australia uh, for allegedly breaching the essential terms of his employment contract. Um, what's on the slide pretty much summarises it. He, was, he had a contract. The contract links to the code. The code contains restrictions on his behaviour. He posted an image. Uh, the image was said to be homophobic and he was dismissed for posting it. That's essentially it. Let's have a look at the code. Now, I'm not sure... I, 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 get, I suspect the, spoke, the picture on the left is too small for you to read, but the important thing for you to take out of it is the, 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 ex, the extracts on the right. So what you'll see there is that the, the code contains... The code contains uh, a fair amount of wriggle language. So you ask yourself, for example, um, he's required to treat everybody fairly and with dignity and have no regard whatsoever for, um, uh, for their age, sexual identity, sexual orientation. So as you see the language in the code, it's, it's pretty loose. So let's just look at an example of applying the code if a player was to hold a door open for a woman or for an older person or a disabled person, and he wouldn't have done it for his teammates, he treats a person unequally and he does so because of their age or their gender. So he breaches the code by holding a door open for somebody. Um, but it, it also goes, goes on to talk about um, not doing anything that's detrimental to the best interest image or welfare of the game. Who knows what that means? Um, if, he, if, he gets, if he gets caught picking his nose in the middle of, middle of a street wearing his rugby uniform, does that breach the code? Um, he's, he's also required to not to use social media in a way, and, and look at the language there, that breaches Rugby Australia's expectations. So unless he knows overtly what those expectations are, he won't know whether he's going to breach the code at all and... and Frankly, I think the point is that, um, that many people breach this code probably every, uh, every day and nothing happens. OK, let's look at what he actually did. He posted that. So he posted a, a post which includes on the right-hand side, as you can see, some, some comments. And on the left-hand side, he includes a meme. So he warns drunks, homosexuals, adulterers, etc. Essentially, uh, all of us, <laughs> I think, um, those of us who uh, who believe that uh, that people are inherently sinful and that you can sin with your mind as well as anything else, uh, we're all on that list, and hell awaits us all but for repentance. Um, however. Um, Apparently, the drunks and adulterers didn't see fit to complain that the homosexuals did. And that led uh, Rugby Australia to, um, to looking at whether or not he breached the code, that rubbery document that I showed you before. They concluded, uh, with the help of an expert panel, that, uh, that he had, and then they moved to summarily dismiss him on the basis that he breached his employment contract. Now, in response to that, um, Israel Folau has um, decided not to take this lying down and I think um, many of us, me included, are very happy about that. He's, in, he's, uh, he's now uh, engaged uh, a reasonably formidable legal team, I think. Um, he's engaged, I think it's McPherson Kelly, to, to assist him as instructing solicitors and Stuart Wood QC to, uh, to, to act as counsel. So... It seems that he's, he's, got a, uh, he's got an argument, and his argument essentially is based on Section 772, which I mentioned earlier. The process he'll follow now is a trip to the, uh, trip to the Fair Work Commission to begin with. 
um, for an attempt at conciliation. Uh, if it doesn't solve a conciliation, then ultimately it's probably destined for uh, to the federal court where uh, they'll determine whether or not the employer's reasons for dismissing him uh, were his religion or reasons that included his religion. What can you take away from this? Well, looking at Israel in particular, um, I guess you've, you've got to... Uh, You've got to say the lessons are broader than him. You need to know what it is as an employee you're signing up for. Somebody's going to hand you a generic employment contract. It's going to say something about policies. Find out what those policies are. Now, we talked, uh, or there was talk a bit earlier about sort of the, the, the militancy of Christianity, the need to be on the front foot, etc. Uh, I think what this also says to us is, we need to be prepared to say to an employer, uh, this job isn't for me if you're going to hold to those sorts of policies and insist that I, that I abide by. So as Christians, that means, that I, I told you before, I'm self-employed. Um, what, that choice was made in part because uh, I didn't want to be in a situation where, um, like Rocco, I worked with one of the, the big firms for a period of time, um, where if I went along and spoke in favour of, as I did, um, uh, preserving traditional marriage. I don't run foul of somebody's policy on the subject. Okay, so the important point, take away, know what your promises are and keep them. Watch the codes very, very closely to make sure um, that you're across what your employer is signing you up for. Um, Beware of the opaquely worded policy. I showed you one. I showed you what um, what Israel Folau had signed. Um, they're often as vague as that. Um, beware how you use social media. Somebody's watching. Uh, I, I thought I'd finish with this, um, which was both an encouragement and a warning. So I thought we should remember as we go out into this world where um, the world doesn't like us very much, or rather doesn't like, uh, doesn't like the Lord we serve. So remember that um, he's got it in control and we don't have to. Uh, secondly, remember when you're feeling like uh, the spine is a little loose and not functioning the way it should in terms of holding you up, that uh, you've got an obligation to stand firm and uh, to, to own the Lord that saved you and to live a life that's consistent with uh, what you've been taught. Um, I, I think given the, the time, I, I, might, I might leave it there, um, but I'm happy if anybody wants to come and chat with me about, uh, about any of this later for them to come and do